all right thank you all for coming to my session it's called deep dive into triple a through a single sign on example so my name is arlene s p knows that i've been a triple you serve for almost seven plus years now and i'm a triple developer with chapter three i mostly deal with the back end uh... and i love triple i guess what that's why i'm here so my history with drupal goes a long way back when i got started uh... i wasn't like exclusively drupal before i used to handle like other systems uh... cms lms uh... moodle and what got me really ho uh, hooked into drupal were the hooks uh... you could say <laughs> And I love Drupal because other systems, you were trying to extend them to customize functionality and something else, and you kind of had to hack them. You had you, you just like copied fi files, you overwrote some classes, if you were lucky, otherwise you overwrote some functions around there, and it just felt really, really hacky. So when I found out about Drupal, how you could create modules, how you could extend their functionality, I just fell in love with that. And it felt so great that I could create a custom module and it would work almost perfectly with any other module that was out there with the, uh, the community contributed. So it's a really nice feature that Drupal has, the fact that there were modules, uh, there were hooks that could be used to extend the system. Um, but as you guys all know, like Drupal 8 has changed. And I'm not gonna go too deep into this, I just wanna like recap what's happened. We used to have lots of types of hooks, there were information hooks and alter and event hooks. So mostly uh, they either allowed one module to define like metadata and tell other modules how they could extend their, their, their type of information. Like for blocks, you had block info where your module could define other types of blocks. You had token info where your module could define some other tokens. Entity info where you could, you could define your own custom entities. So those were just ways of defining metadata that were in Drupal 7 in previous versions. And there were the alternative and events, uh, so hooks to react to other events within the system, like hook init to hook onto the, when the page was loading, uh, menu alter to alter the menu structure. Um, there were tons of other uh, hooks in Drupal 7 and previous versions. Drupal 8 is a bit different. <coughs> so we have all been hearing like the greatness and goodness that Drupal 8 has that it's object-oriented, blah, blah, blah. That brings us that we have interfaces, dependency injection, unit tests, and all those goodies that we have. And when I was trying to learn Drupal 8, like I come from a computer science background, but I've been too deep into Drupal for so many years that you could say like I was rusted in my OOP skills. So c going back to Drupal 8 was like, let me, let me try to recap all the kinds of concepts that are here. And Drupal also has a lot of Drupalisms, as so it's just something that you need to relearn as well. So I decided to, to learn with a uh, project. Like, let's, let me try to build a module in Drupal 8 that uses these new concepts. Uh, so when I went about and read about all the changes and research, the information that was out there, it was way too theoretical. Everyone was going on about what plugins were and the new architecture and events and and plugin managers, and I was like, okay, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna use that in my modules? Or how, how am I gonna know how to extend another module from Contrib? So, in, in Drupal A, there were a few hooks left. There's still too many, in my opinion, but there's still a lot of hooks in there. Uh, and the architecture has changed. So, the main idea of this uh, session was to share with you guys my experience learning Drupal A and uh, building this custom module. So my goal uh, when I was building this <coughs> custom site was to use Drupal core um, and just try to like, have as little con as con from contrib as possible. So I was just using the core modules, uh, the val admin toolbar just to have like a nice UI. And my goal was to add a social, to have a, a website where users could register using a social login, either a Google login or their Facebook credentials. And I did not want to allow crea creation of accounts outside of social logins. So that was just my goal. Um, and for the first part, you know, not allowing users to create accounts on the site if it wasn't for Google or Facebook, it's really easy. You just go to configure your site and say, oh, only administrators have to create accounts and no one can create accounts otherwise. 
Um, so that's easy. And I just added a couple of profile fields to the user entity just so I could have places, uh, a place to have the metadata in there. Where it gets interesting is when I was researching how to implement this uh, social login thing. So it looks complicated. It's, it's not too complicated once you get into that. Uh, and fortunately, in Drupal, we have other modules that already deal with this kind of complexity. And I always try to reuse the contrib module where possible instead of maintaining custom functionality myself. But it's really interesting to get to know how <laughs> some of these functionalities work. So um, I had an option when I was doing research to, to connect to Google. And they use OAuth and OpenID. They support that protocol. So I dove into that. And I just want to share with you guys how that like workflow works behind the scenes. So on the first run, we got our user. And let's just say they try to log in using their credentials, their Google credentials. So they'll go to your website. They'll type that in in, your in their browsers. And it'll send them to, like, the, 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 the browser will request a page from your server. Uh, your server will uh, show a page. Well it, well, it will do a redirect to Google. And that's the page where it says, like, oh, put your username, your password here, and authorize the application, blah, blah, blah. So the user will provide their credentials. The browser will send their credentials to Google. And if they're correct, then the server will answer with an authorization code. And it issues a redirect with that authorization code to your website right here. Your website, your server, gets that authorization code. And it uses this to ping Google and try to exchange it for a, a token request. And then Google re responds with a token. And your site is authorized. So it's, it's, it's not too complicated. <laughs> There's a lot of arrows in there, but it's the user like inputting their credentials. Google sends an authorization code. And your server responds with a, uh, it's a it, we want, it requests a token. And Google responds with a token. And all of this is just OAuth 2. And what OAuth allows is authorization. So far, our website, when it gets this authorization, does not have any clue who the user is or what his profile fields are, what his email is, or anything else. So that's the part that OpenID fills in. OpenID is based on OAuth 2. And very br briefly, what it does is, besides responding with an authorization code, it also adds another ID token, which is a JSON web encoded token. And it just provides like the user information within that token. So that way, your website can get authorized, and it can authenticate a user as well. But as I mentioned, Drupal is great, and there's an OpenID Connect module, which deals with that bunch of arrows going in and out of Drupal and your website. Uh, so what I did was uh, require and install the OpenID Connect module. And I installed it. And this is the interface that it provides out of the box. So because Google plays nicely with the OpenID protocol, it, it already has a Google uh, plugin. So what I was doing, just, just trying to map the profile fields that Google sends. They, the, the profile fields are called claims uh, when you're talking about OpenID protocol. So just mapping the claims to the profile fields you've got in your Drupal site. Uh, so I was just mapping like the name. It's the first name, family name. It's called last name. So just like translating fields here and there. And uh, you need to create an application on Google so you can actually um, ping Google with, a, with an application code. So uh, you go to, Google, to console developers at Google. Uh, you create an application. And you have to uh, let Google know which of their services your application will be using. So uh, you would add Google OAuth to client ID. It needs a bit of config. Google needs to know uh, which redirect URL to use. So this is a redirect URL for that module. Um, just open ID connect slash and, and Google. Uh, and this would work, ju just doing these two things would work with OAuth too. But because we'll also be using OpenID and we want to request the user information, we need to enable the Google Plus API for Google as well. <laughs> Otherwise, we would not get all the user information. Uh, 
So once we have that information, Google will give us a client ID and a secret, which we will, we will just use that to configure um, the OpenID module page. And we add the OpenID connect login block on, on the block interface, and this is how our site looks. So now a user that visits our site has a block where it says login with Google. They click that button, it sends them to Google, and there's the, the authorization and authentication request. So it tells you like what permissions your application is requesting. Um, if you allow, then it does the redirect to your side, and you can see the user has been logged in, and it pulled in the, the profile information from Google into your Drupal site. So, so far it's just been site building, and it was really awesome. I was like, oh cool, this is like, I, I haven't needed any code so far. I'm gonna need another extra project to learn code. Let me try Facebook. <laughs> okay. So Facebook does not use OpenID protocol. They've got their proprietary Facebook login workflow. Um, why they do not use Facebook login? Uh, I guess they're just like too popular and have their own product, or just want the market share, I have no idea. Uh, but the Facebook login is based on OAuth 2, and it's actually pretty similar to OpenID. So that's where I found out I could get my hands dirty and start coding a solution and try to extend the OpenID Connect module. So first of all, I needed to create a module from scratch. Uh, using Drupal console to generate, uh, bootstrap all the classes there, just boilerplate code. Uh, my module name is called example. You know, and, and all, the, all I need is a info.yaml file for my example module. So this is my, uh, you know, you place it in your modules custom and the name of your, your module, example.info.yaml. I just declared that dependency on the OpenID Connect module. It was like the only custom thing I was doing there. So I've got my module now. And this is where the tricky thing and where the learning curve uh, started, like getting interesting. I, I opened the OpenID Connect module. I'm actually gonna pull it up over here, PHP Storm. So there's the OpenID Connect module. And there's, like if you're new to Drupal 8 or object-oriented stuff, like there's so many files all around and folders, and folders within folders, etc. So what I thought found really interesting is going into someone else's code, into Contrib, and trying to figure out how to extend that module. So Drupal 8 uses plugins, which is the preferred way to have your module be extensible for someone else. And I found out this module was using the plugin architecture because of a couple of things. So you can see there's an OpenID Connect client manager class. So client managers class, uh, a manager class, it's basically a class that it's in charge of finding plugins of a particular type. So what that tells us is that when there's a manager <coughs> class, most likely that module is declaring a new type of plugin. So that's, that's a clue in there. You can also see there's an annotation folder there. So they're declaring a new type of annotation. And what's really the telltale sign, if you open the client manager class, like if you just want to look into the code, is that big enough? Okay. So this is, uh, when you declare your own plugin class that will extend this type of plugin, uh, this tells you like where to place it, you need to place your pl custom plugin within your folder, in the source directory, in the plugin directory, in a folder called OpenID Connect Client. So that's the name, like the, the, the folder structure that it should follow. And then the class that you create to extend this module should implement this interface. Drupal OpenID Connect Plugin OpenID Connect Client Interface. And then it also tells you that your plugin has to have this annotation, OpenID Connect Client. So the annotation, this class described here, is described in the annotation class right here. So there's not too much in here. 
so you can just see that the annotation needs two fields, ID and label, and that's it. So I went like, okay, this, this does not look way too complicated. I think I can try to handle it. Uh, and then I found out there's something really interesting, a design pattern within most Drupal modules. Uh, so this module declares a new type of plugin, an OpenID Connect client plugin. And as I mentioned, your plugin needs to implement a particular interface, which was this, this interface right here. So this, if I open this interface, uh, there's like five mo uh, methods your, your class should declare. But most of the modules that declare any type of plugin already have a base class that do that basically. So they already implement the base interface. And all you need to do is extend that base class that that module already provides. So you do not need to worry too much about like trying to work it out or, I mean you could obviously override any method you need, but usually they provide the base functionality as well. So it's just like blocks. If you've ever created a block in Drupal 8, you do not need to create all the methods, just like a particular method that will display whatever information you need or override a particular thing. So most of the, me of the, of the, of the modules that declare new types of plugins provide the base class that you just need to extend. So I decided to go ahead and create a new type of create my Facebook plugin for the Open ID Connect module. Okay, so that was me inspecting the module. But in case you guys are wondering, like, what is a plugin? How many of you guys have uh, crafted Drupal 8 modules? You? Okay. Have you done plugins, services? Yeah? Okay, so let's fear your hands. So plugins, as I mentioned, uh, it's the, the preferred way of extending a Drupal 8 module. And it's like, it's a fancy name. But it's just, you can declare like any piece of functionality that is swappable by anything else. So blocks is, is a classic example. You can have so many different types of blocks, but they all work the same way. Drupal does not care what your block does, it just cares that it can call a certain method within your class, and it, it will just render it and use it the same way. So uh, they're defined by an interface in the object-oriented terminology. Uh, so what that means is that Drupal can interact with them in the same way and what types of plugins we have in there. We have like blocks are types of plugins, all the field types are plugin types, uh, CK editor plugins, text filters, OpenID Connect clients in this case. And it just means that the functionality, they all work externally the same even though they do the things differently within, but Drupal can call them in the same way. Okay. So I wanted to create my Facebook OpenID plugin that extended the OpenID Connect client base class. So here it is. Uh, the class's name is Facebook. It extends OpenID Connect client base, which is a base class, uh, and a couple of pointers in this class. So the first one is that this class, uh, is this the font big enough for you guys at the back? Okay, let me open it up here. Okay, so this, the first thing that I wanna call out is this annotation here. So as we saw in the client manager class, uh, the, the plugin needs to have this annotation defa defined. OpenID Connect Client, and here it is, OpenID Connect Client. And when we looked at the annotation class, it declared two fields, which were ID and label. So I'm just declaring the ID and label required for, for that type of uh, annotation. The second thing that should be called out is where do you actually place that class? And we go back to the, the manager class and it said you have to place it in plugin open ID connect client folder. So you can see I'm, I'm placing my class in the source folder, plugin, open ID connect client. So by placing it in there, we're implementing what uh, it's called the PSR4 standard. 
Uh, it just means that if you place it in the right place, Drupal is, or PHP is going to be automatically, automatically loaded. You do not need to let someone else know where it is or require, include, or anything else. Just place it there, enable your module, and it's going to be found. Your plugin is going to be detected. Another thing is that if your module has some configuration, uh, you might need to define some uh, <coughs> default configuration for when you enable your module. So in this case, I'm just declaring like null values for any like custom settings my module has. The settings were already declared in the base uh, class. I I'm not defining any other uh, settings in my module. So what I did was basically copy from the OpenID Connect module whatever they had in install. So just clone the Google configuration into my configuration. So it's just declaring null values in there for the default configuration. And any configuration you place for your module, it's going to be in config install. So I just enabled my module. Uh, and it got detected. You can see there's the Facebook OpenID Connect client in there. Uh, it's inheriting the same fields as the base class, the client ID and client secret. Uh, what's interesting about getting to, to, to work with Facebook was that a lot of the functionality, as I mentioned, was already provided by the base class. So um, what was different using Facebook instead of using uh, Google was that Facebook kind of names stuff differently. They don't have like um, standard URLs for uh, their endpoints. So I defined the endpoints in here. Let me just pull this up. So I defined the Facebook endpoints in here where you need to uh, go for the authorization for the token and to retrieve the user info. So it, this, this kind of took a bit of digging around in their documentation because I was so annoyed when I went to look to Facebook, their docs, and I went looking for web documentation, like for their APIs. And when they talk about web, all they describe is JavaScript. I was like, okay, come on, PHP is a web language, not just JavaScript. Uh, so what I did was basically download their SDK for PHP and just like grab around for URLs and try each one to see what they were doing. Uh, Stack Overflow also helped. So uh, those three actually work really well. And basically, this, this endpoints, what they do is, uh, in the little dry diagram I showed you guys in the beginning, it's like where it's going to ping for all that information, like for the, use, for the token, for the user information, and for authorization. And the only thing I overrode uh, was like the naming that Facebook was giving to stuff. So like when it retrieved the user info, uh, like you needed to have another bearer token, like in authorita authorization, instead of providing it in a different way. So it's just like formatting the request that it's sending to, to Facebook before uh, sending it out. And like Facebook has their own claim format. Instead of saying first name, they say given name, uh, family name. It's, uh, so it's, it's just like a different naming that they have. And the ID token, the one that provides the user info, like they call, they call it a different way as well. So it's just like parsing their format into what the OpenID protocol requires. Um, at the end of the presentation, I have a link for the, for the source code of the module. It's, it's on GitHub if you want to look more deeply into that class. So you, you do the same process for Facebook. You need an application to actually start using the OpenID Connect stuff. So you go to Developers Facebook with your account, your regular Facebook account, and you can create an application. Facebook is a bit particular, like what are you going to be using your application for? So you need to say it's an app for pages, and again, what kind of products will you be using in your application? So you select Facebook login, and you enable client OAuth login. You also need web OAuth login and it'll ask for the redirect URL, uh, which is this. Once you provide that, uh, Facebook gives you the client ID and client secret. You just plug it in. 
there you go. Now, when the user, an anonymous user visits your website, they have two options, log in with Facebook or log in with Google. And if you log in with Facebook, you know, it, it provides, uh, it sends you to Facebook to authenticate and authorize. Uh, and you accept and you go back to the Drupal site and you can see it's pulled in user info as well and you have a user account. So I was really happy. But I, I like, I didn't, there was still a bunch of concepts I hadn't applied yet. So I was like, okay, what else can I do with this website that would make it uh, simpler for the user? Uh, and I decided that I wanted to create a social login page. So I did not like the user slash login because that presented the, the form for user, for Drupal user and Drupal password. And my users are not gonna have a Drupal user and Drupal password. So I decided to create a new, a new uh, path, a new page within Drupal that would just present the login block. So how do you do that? So you need to generate a controller. So I'm using, again, Drupal console to, to bootstrap the, all the classes, boilerplate code. Uh, the, it'll just ask me like for information, like on what module do you want your controller? Give me a name for the class. Uh, what method within that class should I call? On what route should I respond to with that particular method? Uh, title, uh, whether you want to load services from the container, in this case, I did because I'm going to be using the form builder. Uh, I will be reusing the login block that's already provided by the log OpenID Connect module, so no need to reinvent the wheel. I already got a working form in there. Uh, and it creates two files. It will create a controller in the controller folder and a routing file. So this might be a bit too small, so I'll pull it up over here. So the routing file, whenever you provide a new URL, a new page on, on your module, you'll find it in the routing file. So this, this is actually pretty nice. I, it's something I really like about Drupal 8. You've got your path for your page, but that path actually has a machine name, you could say. Uh, in Drupal 7, if you try to reference like another route, you have to, you have to reference by the full URL it had within the system. So if someone tried to override that path, uh, you could get like in weird, complicated ways where it was not that path anymore, uh, sticky situations. And now you can just reference the path by the machine name. So there's no confusion anymore. And all that this is declaring is that this path will be found here. And whenever you visit that page, it will call this controller class, SSO login controller. It will call this method within that class and you can define any access uh, control stuff in here. In this case, I want it to be available for everyone, so I just declare true. But you can have other conditions like only anonymous users, only authenticated users, or have more complicated uh, information in there, other conditions. Now, if we inspect the actual login controller, the class that will respond when you visit that page, So it's actually quite a simple class. As most stuff within Drupal, it extends another base class. So it extends controller base. And this you do not need to worry about. Basically, it's just the bootstrap, uh, the boilerplate code. So the only thing that I, I wrote was like this five lines of code. And the login page uh, method, well, all it does is if the user is actually anonymous, then it will use a form builder service to display this form the open ID connect form. So that's the one that gives us like two links to Facebook or to Google. And if the user is not logged in, then it will just redirect to the front page. So it was just five lines of code and uh, I have a new working page within Drupal where you could visit uh, user slash login SSO and it will present that block within the page. So not too bad, just five lines of code. We have a new page. That was nice. And then I decided, well, wait, I have a user login, as like a social login page. I, I do not, like everyone knows that URL, user login. I do not want them to type that in and like get a user login page. It's gonna be confusing. 
So I went ahead and decided that I wanted to change the default, uh, to hide it, you could say, the default user login path. So how do you do that in Drupal 8? You would use a route subscriber. So route subscribers are a special kind of services. Services are just functionality that's reused across the application, basically. Uh, so when you have a service that's tagged, it's just like a certain category of services that get called in a particular moment. So in this class, it's tagged with an event subscriber because it's going to be called uh, when an event happens. Oops. Sorry. So again, uh, Drupal console provides us with a route subscriber method, which is really nice and neat. It, it asks you like which module do you need this route subscriber for? Uh, what service? Do you, what machine name do you want to give your service, just so it can be called by other modules as well, or your own module? Uh, give the a class a name, and it will generate a couple of files or update them. And it will create the route subscriber class, and it will update or create the services.yaml file. So the services.yaml file, I'll pull it up in here as well. This is the one stuff we're interested in right now. So this is like the machine name of our service, the route subscriber, and this is the name of the class. You can see there's like, you would not need, once you, would, you create the, the, you use Drupal console to generate this, you would not need to go in and edit any of this. You just need to know that it's the class route subscriber. So let's go look into the route subscriber class. So again, I just wrote three lines of code for this. This will change the user login, pay, uh, user login page to another non-standard uh, URL, which is non-SSO login. Just want to make it ugly so people would not type it. Uh, and all I say is like, here's the collection of all the routes that Drupal has in this um, argument. I just tell it to have the, the user login page, which is the machine name of this user login page and change its path to whatever new path I want to. So it's just three lines of code and you can alter a path. That's also really neat. So now if you go visit user login page, you'll get a page not found because we just switched that URL. And then I decided to do something else as well. So just because it's very annoying to go to a page and then you get uh, access denied, uh, I decided to redirect that to the login page, to my social login page, not to Drupal's default. Uh, and after they log in, I wanted to redirect them back to the page they were on before they got the access denied page. So you do that with an event subscriber. And again, the, the, it's a kind of service tag with event subscriber. So this is where it also got a bit interesting because I'm gonna create an event subscriber, but the question is like, which event am I gonna subscribe to? So Drupal has some not too great documentation yet, but there's a list of all the events that Drupal has so far, uh, at least Drupal core in the, the official documentation. Uh, this is just, some, an, an, ex, an excerpt from that, it's not the whole list. Uh, but I found out that the event I needed was kernel events exception, because that's a 403 access, uh, access denied uh, error exception. So if you do not want to go into the docs or um, you just want to see like which events are available on your site as well, there's another command that lets you see which events are available on your site. So you just type with Drupal console, event debug, and it'll list all the events your, your site has. Uh, but this is like if you already know what you're looking for, if you know what a kernel exception is, et cetera. So there's lots of events in Drupal, and it's really neat. Like you got entity type events when they update entities, delete entities. Uh, there's also migration events when you finish migrating. migrating and so you can just look into this page and find which events are there. So to redirect the access denied page to login, you generate an, an event subscriber using console. 
again, which module is this uh, subscriber for? Uh, type in a service name, the machine name, give the class a name, which event are you going to be responding to, and which method is going to be called within that class once you uh, get that exception. Um, whether you want to load any services from the container, so I was using the redirect destination service, and it will update the services YAML file and it create a new class. So this is the new uh, section that was added. Let me pull that up again in here. So you can see it's a machine name. There's the name of the class, and um, it just gives it the argument of the exception. So let's look at that class, event subscriber class. Like any event subscriber that you would need in Drupal has the same format. Uh, so get subscribe events just lets Drupal know which events are you going to be reacting to. So in this case, it's an, you, you can respond to a bunch of, an event, of events within your, this same class. So you just say, it's an array actually, so it, you can react to as many events as you want, and just say which method within this class uh, is going to be called for which particular event. So in this case for kernel events, an exception, it's going to call this method, which is on kernel exception, this uh, you get an, as an argument the event itself. So what I need to figure out, like, there can be so many different kinds of kernel exceptions. So I have to check the type, get the exception from the event extracted, and just check if it's an instance of access and HTTP exception. If it's not that, like, I don't care, proceed to whatever error handling Drupal default has. Uh, but if it is an access and night exception, then I just want to save, like, the page they were on. Uh, to later on redirect them to that page. And I just like create a query out of that. And I check if the current user is not logged in, then uh, redirect them to my social login page. So this was the, the machine name of that page. Uh, and issue a redirect this response to that page. And once they log in, uh, Drupal, because we're setting the destination parameter, uh, the redirect destination just does that. When they log in, they will automatically get redirected to whatever page they were on. So again, it's just like 12 lines of code or so, and we have another neat functionality in there. So now if you're not, if you're not logged in, you visit a page, uh, you would get the login page, and you can see there's a destination uh, parameter there with the, with the path. So using all of this in Drupal has been really, has been really neat, and it's been a, an, an exciting learning path for me, uh, just remembering all the OOP. Like, I, I found out that it's really organized. Code is really organized in Drupal 8. There's no more 2,000 plus lines of code per module file. Uh, weird naming of files in different places, trying to dig around someone else's code. So, so it's really nice. It's actually really, really nice. Uh, I don't know if you have guys have any questions or comments at this point. Thank you. So I, I guess my main point was trying to show you guys that it's not difficult to go into another person, another uh, contributed module, trying to figure out like the structure it has, because now we have a better architecture in Drupal 8. And it's easier to extend someone else's modules using plugins, services, and event subscribers. Uh, and if you get a little more advanced level, you can actually try implementing like a new type of plugin. Uh, but just looking through someone else's code is not too intimidating. Uh, and it's fun. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Hi. Extremely awesome presentation. Thanks. Um, how did you figure out which event to subscribe to? Because I confess that list, list looks extremely okay. Yeah. I think right now the list is bigger. When I got started with this <laughs> module, it was not so big. So uh, I just reading the docs and like people commenting on, on Drupal as issues. I did not have a clue back then. Now it makes more sense. Like it's a kernel exception because this, like the HTTP code, it's it's an exception. So, 
but you just kind of need to know like what's there. There are not too many, probably like around 30 events in Drupal right now, or ish, 30, 40 ish. So it's manageable. <laughs> The redirect? Yeah, how did you find that so before doing this presentation, uh, I also got started like on a way more technical presentation about what types of architecture uh, models or design patterns were available in Drupal 8. And I had seen there were uh, events, event subscribers, like so many different types of uh, conceptual ideas in Drupal 8. So I had an idea of, of what a route subscriber was already. Uh, but it's a very fairly frequent uh, thing in Drupal 8, you could say. So it's it's going to be used fairly frequently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just put this in. For everybody who's figuring that about Drupal 8, I don't know much about it, but I, I did a lot of work with FBO off for Drupal 7. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like, was there any interest in looking at it to make some of this happen? Or is it So that's a really interesting question. I would love to get it out of an in contrib like for OpenID Connect uh, module. Uh, but the fact is that Facebook does not officially support this. They've got their Facebook login product, so they want you to use a Facebook login product. So it might change like this URLs or have some other breaking change that I'm not gonna be aware of uh, fast enough. Uh, so I could, I could publish this, I mean it's on GitHub. Uh, but I'm not sure it would be a good idea to pull it out on contrib, an official contrib module, and have people depend on it. I guess I, was, I don't know if that's quite my question. Matt. Oh, uh, to, to do this first, why, why wouldn't you have used some of the code from the Drupal 7 module? Oh, because I wanted to learn Drupal 8. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> same here. I yeah. want to learn how to like, migrate modules from yeah, yeah, yeah. 7 to 8. I, I would look into that, but a lot of the code in Drupal 7 is just structured way differently, That's and it's a lot of that. overhead to maintain. That's what I wanted to describe. What's, yeah, what's up with that? Or is there any ways to like, help, help with that? Or are, are all the Drupal 8 modules being rewritten in general? Or? Not all of them. I think a big chunk of them are. That's why it's taking a, a little bit too long. Yeah. Uh, just because it's a great opportunity to not carry on technical depth yeah. and like have a like pause and rethink what we're doing. So if it also Drupal 8 provides a lot of functionality of the bus. Yeah. Another thing to redirect the module is because Drupal 8 provides a lot of functionality out of the bus and services. So it's better to redirect to the new class and use injectable services. You just write two lines of code, five lines of code instead of writing a whole thing trying to migrate or you know twenty lines of code to our functions all over the place. It's better we use so would you say there's a bigger lift from, say, going Drupal 6 to Drupal 7? Uh, Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 is a lot, a lot bigger lift. A lot bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Drupal console does help you, so just generate the Drupal console does this with this whole integration. Thank you guys. Just a quick reminder about Drupal Sprints tomorrow. There's going to be uh, pretty interesting stuff happening there. And just thank you all for coming. Please provide feedback. I think I do. Yeah. I'm a com science guy and coming in from Java. So it might be easier for you because yeah. a lot of us in Drupal were like so stuck doing like was, functional programming. Yeah, I was wanting to know about the event model and stuff, you know, the pub sub, publish subscribers.